Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so it's my privilege really to, to introduce Father Nicholas to you tonight. I want to say a word about the remaining talks. So, of course, tonight's is on Evil and Wah, and Brideshead Revisited. Hopefully you notice the teddy bear on the poster. We can learn about the significance there later. But next week will be Father Henry Steffen, who um, is a parochial vicar at St. Gertrude in Cincinnati, or Dominican Parish in Cincinnati. And he's going to be talking on Pride and Prejudice and Prudence, <laughs> Jane Austen and the Life of Virtue. And then the last talk, two weeks from today, April 11th, Father Patrick Briscoe will be speaking on Paul Claudel. This will be more of a spiritual meditation on the cross, poetry in the cross. Um, so Father Patrick's coming in from Providence, Rhode Island to do that talk. Also, if this is the first one you've come to, I was gonna ask if, if you're interested in any lectures like this in the future, just for the sake of having a little bit more direct uh, announcement, please uh, put your email on this list. I won't spam you with extra emails. It'll actually just be an email from me. Um, uh, but if you could consider adding your email to this list, I'll, I can pass it around um, or grab it. Anyone, anyone first wants to start it off? Okay. I had a pencil on there, pen on there. There you go. Very good. Well, I want to introduce to you Father Nicholas Ingham. Father Ingham is a philosopher and he taught philosophy for many years at Providence College and has recently, well, retired from teaching, but not from active priestly ministry as he's serving in a, an important way at our parish in Youngstown, Ohio, St. Dominic's in Youngstown. Um, so he's been there since January, is that right? Um, so we're very happy to have him close to us out west. Uh, Father Nicholas really combines um, a tremendous uh, zeal for the Dominican life and, uh, and a love of learning. I think his, his, he, he won't be able to, to hide his erudition in this talk. And so I am, am especially pleased just personally, as a friend, as a brother, pleased that he answered my, my request to, to give this talk and specifically to give this talk on Brideshead Revisited. Uh, on Evelyn Waugh, a, a book near and dear to my heart, and I like to, to spread the good news of. So I hope that Father Nicholas will help take us deeper into this topic tonight. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Father Raymond. A twitch upon the thread. At one of the many very awkward moments in Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited, Lady Marchmain reads a passage from G.K. Chesterton's detective story, The Queer Feet. I caught him, that is the thief, says Chesterton's Father Brown, with an unseen hook and an invisible line, which is long enough to let him wander to the ends of the world and still to bring him back with a twitch upon the thread. This some have seen as the vagus nerve of Brideshead Revisited, a story about God's unseen hooks and Grace's invisible lines. For over the course of these sacred and profane memories of Captain Charles Ryder, the book's subtitle, ostensibly good Catholics, the agents of grace, emerge as heroes and heroines, sometimes in spite of themselves. Ostensibly bad Catholics, the unwitting instruments of grace, become lamps of insight unto our feet and vessels of wisdom to our understanding. And ostensibly hopeless ex-Catholics, renegades, and confirmed secularists 
the fish invisibly hooked and twitched are spotted as victims of an implacable grace and a providential return to God that will not be confounded. But I should like to suggest this evening that Waugh's story is far more egalitarian. Some get actual Chestertonian hooks and threads, but everyone gets something like a hook and something like a thread. Everybody needs twitching. Everybody needs reeling in. All the Catholics are in some way bad Catholics, but not all in the same way. All are unwitting instruments of grace, even those who see themselves as very willing agents and abettors. All, without exception, are victims of an implacable providence and of a grace both ruthless and relentless, what Graham Greene would in a different context term the appalling strangeness of God's mercy. It all gravitates around a place. Brideshead is in fact Eden after the fall. But it's an Eden from which Adam and Eve have refused to exit, and which their continuing presence has corrupted, so that the garden has now become a weed patch, and Arcadia, in the end, a military camp. The one remaining physical touch with the divine is a chapel, which the Blessed Sacrament visits and deserts and revisits. For yes, it is not only Charles Ryder, it's Jesus himself who is the revisitor in Brideshead Revisited. As I say, it all gravitates around a place, a great country house in Wiltshire. Brideshead, like the Genesis story of Eden, is a tale of a place. More of that later. Let me begin, though, with a bit of background on Waugh himself. Arthur Evelyn St. John Waugh, born 28 October 1903, West Hampstead, London, died 10 April 1966, Combe Flory, Somerset, was an English novelist, biographer, travel writer, journalist, and literary critic. His most famous works include The Satires, Decline and Fall, 1928, A Handful of Dust, 1934, Scoop, 1938, the novel Brideshead Revisited, 1945, and his trilogy about World War II, The Sword of Honor, 1952 through 1961. Waugh studied at Hartford College, Oxford, in an atmosphere of fashionable and aristocratic gatecrashing, for he was always an outsider looking in on a titled plutocracy. The boy from the striving classes who developed a taste and a virtuoso skill for managing the higher nobility and its country house society. He converted to Catholicism in 1930 after the failure of his first marriage, but like Chesterton, seemed to have subterranean Catholic instincts long before his actual conversion and long before God's twitch upon his thread. The changes of the Second Vatican Council, a great blow to his religious traditionalism, his dislike of the post-war welfare culture, and the decline of his health all darkened his last years. He died in 1966, a disappointed man. Eclipsed briefly after his death, he gained new following through media remountings of his works, chiefly the television serial Brideshead Revisited, 1981, with its superbly faithful teleplay by John Mortimer of Rumpole of the Bailey fame. Waugh is widely recognized as one of the great prose stylists of 20th century English. 
Brideshead is his best known work and his style at its most felicitous. And that's enough about war. Now to the characters of Brideshead and to the appalling grace that spots and turns them. I'll begin in the least likely place with the good and exemplary bad Catholics. Lady Marchmain, Lord Brideshead, and Lady Cordelia Flight. I've deliberately left out two. Nanny Hawkins and the Jesuit Father Mowbray. Nanny's role is chiefly a connecting one, not a substantively contributing one. She sets scenes and brings people together in groups. So I apologize to the Nanny Hawkins fan club. I would gladly support a Nanny Hawkins t-shirt movement. <laughs> Father Mowbray comes close to being a mere doctrinal plot engine. A perfect role, the invidious might say, for a Jesuit of the older, more orthodox cut. Admirable as he is, I think we can do without a Father Mowbray t-shirt society. <laughs> Lady Marchmain, popularly regarded, popularly regarded as a saint, according to her younger son, Lord Sebastian Flight, is the very model of the upright and pious Pharisee. And I'm understanding Pharisee here in the best and noblest possible sense, the sense in which Jesus himself would have been thought a Pharisee by outside observers. She is devout, zealous for her faith, responsible to the point of protective overmanagement, perhaps a trifle two-dimensional and unyielding in her moral rectitude. She speaks ill of no one, aggressively. <laughs> and her one real and very subdued outburst, her grand remonstrance of Charles Ryder, is delivered in private to Ryder himself, even though the household eventually learns all the dirt. She embarrasses no one in public and without a shred of pity. And yet, all the same, her Catholicism is in its own way a defective Catholicism. For her, grace acts under the law. For her, grace requires a preliminary ironclad control of circumstances. She devises lives for her children and, of course, drives away both her middle children. Lord Sebastian and Lady Julia Flight. Her allies, Lord Brideshead and Lady Cordelia Flight, the oldest and youngest of her children, show the strain continually. Lord Brideshead, Bridie, regularly apologizes for her regularly awkward and counterproductive rules and precepts as my mother's way. Lady Cordelia confides to Charles that she and Charles, and they alone, are the only ones who have really loved Sebastian. One might say that Lady Marchmain's hook is her very Pelagianized faith. Her invisible line, the lengths which God allows her to make a thoroughly upright mess of the lives of those around her and the twitch upon the thread, her last suffering, and her edifying death. It doesn't rectify things right away, but it acts as a leaven upon the loaves of everyone else for the next decade. Had Lady Marchmain really trusted in God for everything, had she backed off and curbed her mania for virtue as interference, had her works been of the caliber of her prayers, everything might have come out differently. Not necessarily better, or even remotely the same, but differently. Lord Brideshead is the next defective Catholic to be reckoned with. Waugh's portrait of Brideshead, Bridey, is about as close as he comes in the novel to parody to outright satire. Even Bridie's technically correct views 
on divine providence come out a little ridiculous. I believe, he remarks about his brother Sebastian, that God prefers drunkards to a lot of respectable people. Brideshead has all the vicious virtues of his mother, but very few of his own, beyond a respectability to which Waugh calls constant and unforgiving attention. He's the very character of the English puka sob, the Victorian Edwardian gentleman. And the irony is that against type, he's a high church Catholic, not a low church Anglican. He falls the dupe of a scheming widow, Mrs. Muspratt, whom he marries and who, Waugh suggests, will dominate him for life. When an impenitent Lord Marchmain refuses to see Father Mackay, the local priest, Bridie splits hairs and quibbles and tries to turn the refusal into a mere postponement. Again, ironically, in the end, he's right. The refusal is a mere postponement. And Lord Marchmain eventually dies absolved and anointed, but not courtesy of Bridie. Here lie Bridie's hook and Bridie's thread. It is his unflinching respectability. Lady Marchmain's Pelagianism pushed to the point of hair-splitting legalism that holds the household together until all the flights return to the faith. It's the fanciful combination of his rigorism and his unthinking version of with God all things are possible that actually provides for the collapse of that rigorism and for God really to make all things possible. By far the most sympathetic of the allegedly good Catholics and very likely the most sympathetic character in the whole novel is Lady Cordelia Flight, an enchanting child who grows up, in her own words, a plain and pious spinster full of good works. Her religiosity and her virtue are heartfelt, and her truly Christian response to the puzzles and reversals of life is instinctive and unforced. But her understanding of her faith at times verges on the superstitious, and her moral judgment is easily overcome by sentimentality. As a schoolgirl, she contributes to a mission scheme in which babies are baptized after the donor at five shillings a head. I've got six black Cordelias already, she announces with pride. Maturity doesn't seem to make that much difference. Isn't it wonderful about Julia and Charles? She gushes to a perplexed Nanny Hawkins, who doesn't quite know what to think about this divorced couple ready to move on to an invalid marriage of their own on the down-and-out Sebastian, taken in by monks at a monastery in Tunis, she passes a very problematic ethical judgment. One can have no idea what the suffering may be to be maimed as he is, no dignity, no power of will. No one is ever holy without suffering. It's taken that form with him no dignity or power of will, and yet holy? Explain, please. And at the end of a dispute about whether Lord Marchmain should see a priest he has already turned away, and right after the Italian mistress, Cara remarks, all I know is that I shall take very good care to have a priest. Bless you, says Cordelia. I think that's the best answer. Excuse me, where is even moderately sound theology in any of that? Yet the irreproachable authenticity of grace in her life somehow cancels out all of these defects. You might almost say that grace is a hook Cordelia welcomes and a thread on which she herself constantly twitches. What of the shadowy 
bad Catholics. The Catholics who both are and aren't quite Catholics. The effeminate and flamboyant aesthete, Antony Blanche, and Lord Marchmain's neat and prosaic Italian mistress, Cara. Apparently far from grace until she starts going back to Mass with Cordelia, Cara's diagnosis of the self-hatred and escapism of Alex, Lord Marchmain, and Sebastian is the most clinical and most perceptive character appraisal in the whole book. When people hate with all that energy, she observes to Charles, it is something in themselves they are hating. Alex is hating all the illusions of boyhood, innocence, God, hope. He loved me for a time, quite a short time, as a man loves his own strength. Now, Alex is very fond of me, and I protect him from his own innocence. Sebastian is in love with his childhood, his teddy bear, his nanny, and he is 19 years old. Sebastian drinks too much. I suppose we both do, pleads a defensively insecure Charles. Oh, with you it does not matter, observes Kara in an almost offhand way. I have watched you together. With Sebastian, it is different. He will be a drunkard if someone does not come to stop him. I have known so many. And alas, Grace was there in Kara's words, but not there to stop Sebastian from becoming a drunkard. Apparently nowhere near Grace, even at the end, the effete Antony Blanche pronounces a summary judgment on Charles Ryder, every bit as withering as Kara's on the flights. I've been watching you, my dear. I'm a faithful old body. I went to your first exhibition, says Antony. I found it charming. Even then, it seemed to me that there was something a little gentlemanly about your painting. You must remember, I am not English. I cannot understand this keen zest to be well-bred. Imagine my excitement at luncheon today. They had all been to your exhibition. How you had broken away, my dear, gone to the tropics, become a Gauguin, a Rambo. The pictures, I said, most peculiar, not at all what he usually does, very forceful, Can it be shut off? OK, uh, I'll go back a bit. You must remember, I am not English. I cannot understand this keen zest to be well-bred. Imagine my excitement at luncheon today. They had all been to your exhibition. How you had broken away, my dear, gone to the tropics, become a Gauguin, a Rambo. The pictures, I said, most peculiar. Not at all what he usually does very forceful, quite barbaric. I call them downright unhealthy, said Mrs. Stuyvesant Oglander. My dear, I could hardly keep still in my chair. I wanted to leap into a taxi and say, take me to Charles's unhealthy pictures. <laughs> and what did I find? I found, my dear, a very naughty and very successful practical joke. It was charm again creamy English charm, playing tigers. Charles admits, you're quite right. Then Antony brings down his intellectual ax. Charm is the great English blight. It does not exist outside these damp islands. It spots and kills everything it touches. It kills love. It kills art. I greatly fear, my dear Charles, it has killed you. And alas, and alas, again Grace is there in the truth of Antony's words, but not there to stop Charles in his thwarted passion for Julia. These two surprising instruments of grace, Cara 
and Antony Blanche provide hooks and threads of their own. Seemingly outside the truth, they have a perspective on the truth that no one else shares. But in the end, they're only instruments. It will be up to God to bring things round. For grace is from God and not from the instrument. In the end, Kara seems to have been hooked and twitched herself. Upon Antony Blanche, Waugh remains silent. Once more, as with Nanny and Father Mowbray, I'm going to engage in a selective omission of the minor characters of Lieutenant Hooper, Rex Mottram, Lady Celia Ryder, and Boy Mulcaster, all fetchingly rendered by Waugh's acidulous pen, but more as types and catalysts than as full-bodied characters. Hooper, the crass secular subaltern, displaced upward by the war, Mottram, the shady one-note politician with whom Julia makes her first disastrous marriage, Lady Celia, the social butterfly whom Charles marries on the rebound after his disillusionment with the flights, and Celia's brother, Boy Mulcaster, the P.G. Woodhouse-style Oxbridge ninny. <laughs> In a perfect world, they would all have hooks, threads, and twitches. But not even Waugh could pull everything off. We come at length to the main hooks and the principal threads, those of Lord Marchmain, Sebastian, Julia, and Charles. Their threads run the length of the book, and their stories, for all their differences, are curiously alike. Tolstoy began Anna Karenina with a now famous quote, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And of course, the truth is just the opposite. There is nothing quite so unique, quite so singular as the happy family, and nothing quite so predictable and unremarkable as the unhappy one. As Chesterton himself might have put it, what seems most interesting about the renegade, his rebellion, ends up wallowing in what is least interesting, his discontent, his pouting. For in the end, all renegades are, like Tolstoy's really unhappy families, more alike than different. Alex, Sebastian, Julia, Charles are all estranged from the faith either by rebellion against it, Alex, Sebastian, and Julia, or by ignorance of it and misinformation about it, Charles. In the lives of each, God allows them a Chestertonian thread that seems very long indeed. In Lord Marchmain's case, over 25 years. But each ultimately responds to the twitch and comes back with a surprising want of ceremony. Cordelia predicts that one day Sebastian will be found dying on the doorstep of the Tunisian monastery and will, by the flicker of his eyelids, welcome an absolution which he is too weak to beg. An apparently unconscious Lord Marchmain blesses himself on his deathbed in response to Father Mackay's absolution. And Charles himself observes that this small gesture was something greater than the veil of the temples being riven in two. Julia dismisses Charles by calling him a rival good that she cannot quite set up against God. And Charles's conversion we see only after the fact when on bivouac he prays in the Bride's Head Chapel. Waugh once wrote to Mary, Lady Mary Ligon, whose family, the Beechams, are the prototypes of the flights, and who was herself the original of Julia, just as her brother Hugh and her sister Dorothy were the inspirations for Sebastian and Cordelia. Waugh wrote, I believe that everyone in his or her life 
has the moment when he is open to divine grace. It's there, of course, for the asking all the time. But human lives are so planned that usually there's a particular time, sometimes like Hubert on his deathbed, when all resistance is down and grace can come flooding in. That puts it almost well. When all resistance is down, when a certain negative state of affairs in regard to God's will has set in, then both wills are seen in their true efficacy. For ironically, God often works most perfectly when the human will has been reduced to a kind of consenting willlessness, a willing willlessness. When what the scholastics call the secondary cause no longer interferes with the primary cause and can no longer claim any foothold of its own. It even, isn't even so much passive acceptance anymore as an active want of the power to refuse what can one can only call the appalling onset of grace. More like an inability to keep from breathing in the presence of real air. Think only of Lord Marchmain's oxygen tank, the substitute air that these people provide for themselves like substitute grace that always fails. And the consent, be it done unto me according to thy word, comes to look very much like a purposive stepping back to let an invisible angel command the scene. The great German Dominican mystic Meister Eckert spoke of Gelassenheit, or a voluntary letting loose, so that God, who is already all in all, may at last become manifest as all in all. Even contemporary German philosophy has picked up the word to signify a surrendering of control, of planning, of determining how things shall be. Perhaps this is what Cordelia meant to say about Sebastian. Perhaps this, this is what Waugh ought to have said about the movement of grace. Yet for this very reason, and that's why I speak of Waugh's putting it almost well, there is usually something altogether pedestrian and not at all flood-like about the twitch upon the thread. Because all that is visible is the external action, the secondary causality, the stepping back. And sometimes when the stepping is a very interior one, not even that. One never sees the letting go, just the effect of it. In Brideshead, there is something almost disappointing about the simplicity with which each will is resolved by grace in favor of the will of God. Something almost annoying about the littleness of the gesture by which each life is dissolved into grace and the will of God. And here we, we reach what I think lies at the heart of the book and what makes it a great book. The story beneath the frisson and the flash and the marvelous style. War whether by plan or by intuition, has seen the fundamental simplicity of God in dealing with his wayward children. War, whether by connivance or by instinct, has identified all the noise and all the commotion for just what it is, noise and commotion. God is almost always very simple and subdued in the way he deals with people. And grace is largely invisible, not only because it is always there in the background, but because there is nothing to show in its workings, only in its afterwards. It moves without mechanism, 
And I wonder if we have not seen this in our own lives. How often the movement of grace, the gesture of God, came very quickly and suddenly and without a flood or even much in the way of fanfare and we did not realize that we had turned or perhaps even better had been turned to God until some time after the fact. And perhaps Waugh has been a bit stingy in his appraisal too. We are vulnerable more often than we realize and vase and grace like the atmosphere can be so pervasive, so appalling in its capacity to stalk its victims that it needs no flood. Just a Chestertonian twitch. A twitch is a very small thing and it may take up far less visible space and theatrical time than either the hook or the thread. If we don't look carefully, we may miss it altogether. And that, this brings me at last to the real revisitation of Brideshead, the return of the Blessed Sacrament to the tabernacle of deplorable design, upon which Charles comments in the last scene of the book. Jesus in the Eucharist has remained very much a background figure throughout the novel, but you wonder if the whole point wasn't to make sure that he revisited Brideshead. After all, Moore might have given so many different titles to the piece. He might have named it after a family, The Flights, as John Galsworthy named another Saka after the Foresights. And the working title soon discarded was The Household of the Faith. Waugh might have named it after a person, the Marquis of Marchmain, or even Sebastian, who begins so central to the novel, but who subsides so surprisingly, yet to tell the truth, satisfyingly. He might even have named it after an era, between two wars, or made its subtitle its title, Memories, as in Nabokov, entitled his autobiography, Speak Memory. But he named it after a place, a place where Christ first lives in the silence of a tabernacle, from which he is then removed for a long Good Friday and Holy Saturday, and to which he returns at last to restore the place to its true identity and the dwellers in that place to theirs. Brideshead Revisited is not paradise regained, but it is a new beginning and a close approximation. And I think it is no coincidence that the novel ends with the outcome of Captain Charles Ryder's thread twitch, his newfound faith, and of its expression, not as a confession of belief, nor as a psalm of praise, nor even as a summing up of what has gone before, but as a prayer made where so much truly authentic and lasting prayer is made in a sacred place, a place made sacred by the one who at last dwells in it, a place made holy by the appalling strangeness of God's mercy. Thank you. Very good. Um, we have time for questions, and um, we can go right out of the gate with questions. And I have right. one uh, to ask as well. Go right ahead. And let me give you the, the, um, the microphone. This won't amplify your voice, but it will allow our audience at home to join in. So. <laughs> Uh, Father, you said something uh, early on about Evelyn Waugh, which <clears throat> it kind of struck me because it's something I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say about anybody else, that he died dissatisfied. A, a disappointed man, yeah. So my, m the question is, how do you su suppose somebody who is, had such insight into human nature and was obviously such a brilliant writer 
and, and a practicing Catholic and whatnot, how would he get to be a point at the end of his life to be a disappointed person? We don't know exactly what happened to him at the moment or even the hour of his death. We do know that for the last few, uh, few years of his life, uh, his, the consistent expression of his views was one of profound disappointment. So maybe that's another invisible twitch and another invisible thread. And as for uh, how he could be so disappointed, I wonder if the depth of his insight wasn't the cause of his disappointment. Uh, if you looked at the world after World War II with Waugh's with Waugh's eyes and understood it with Waugh's mind, how could you not be disappointed? Nothing seemed to be getting better. Everything seemed to be uh, in decline. But not necessarily disappointed with himself or his own life. Uh, we don't know. All we know is what, what he said at the end. He, uh, uh, he seemed disappointed. Many, many of the things he said were cynical. Were they said for effect? Or did he mean them? We don't know. We only, we, uh, you know, we, you, don't, you, you don't see the action of grace. You see only the afterwards. But, if, but once he died, then you don't see the afterwards. God does. Thank you. That's a, that, I'm afraid that's the best I can do. No, you want to say, why, I, I can, I, I'm sympathetic with your point. Why wouldn't someone uh, with that great insight not be blessed by God with a kind of unifying vision which would make him happy at the end? I don't know. I want to ask a question yeah. about the, um, uh, one of my favorite passages um, is, is this turning point in the book when Julia suddenly realizes her sin because she's been called out by Bridie. Right. Uh, and she realizes she's in an adulterous affair and it's finally been called that. Um, and she personifies sin in this really striking way. The scene by the fountain. The scene by the fountain. Yeah. Would, you, would you have anything to say about, about how that fits in? Yes, I, I deliberately left it out. Uh, uh, that was a, a choice I had to make. And the reason I left it out is I've never been completely convinced that uh, the scene by the fountain was entirely sincere. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, there's something almost a little too histrionic mm -hmm. about it. Uh, 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 Waugh knows how to hit exactly the right pitch mm -hmm. and at exactly the right volume. And uh, here, uh, this uh, 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 the, this explosion by the fountain. And in fact, uh, one of the first ones to uh, uh, point it out was uh, John Mortimer, who did the, uh, uh, who did the teleplay. He said, he said uh, as uh, dramatic as it is, you find it odd that this woman should suddenly be making such a confession to her completely secular lover who cannot possibly understand mm. what it is she's saying. Mm. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, he concludes, Perhaps, th perhaps this is one instance where um, we're playing to the gallery. Mm. It's not entirely sincere. Mm. And uh, uh, in support of that, I would say, uh, you you'll notice in the scene right after, um, it's, uh, it's even more, uh, 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 more forceful in the book. Uh, she recovers remarkably well. Mm. It, uh, you, would, you would expect a, 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 uh, a, a more lasting effect and you don't see anything until very nearly en near mm -hmm. the end when, um, her, uh, when her attitude turns out to be much more theologically sophisticated. Mm. Uh, she's no longer saying, oh, I'm an adulterous woman, I'm wicked, I'm Bathsheba, and all of that. Mm -hmm. What she says is, uh, if I went with you, Charles, I would uh, have fallen into the danger of setting up a rival God, a rival mm -hmm. good to God. Mm -hmm. Which is much more theo which is theologically much more sophisticated mm -hmm. than simply saying I've been a bad girl and adulterous and kicked mm -hmm. over every trace I was taught. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, w I'm afraid I can't answer your question mm -hmm. because I've always uh, been of two minds mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that whole fountain mm -hmm. scene. I'm not convinced it's entirely sincere. Mm -hmm. Part of what made me think of it recently is reading Kristen Lavin's daughter again, and there's this very similar passage where the main character personifies her sin as this child. Uh, in the same way that Julia does at that scene. So there's an interesting, but there I think it's more clearly well, there, sincere. But well, there it makes sense because well, she, she does it in a context where the action itself will be understood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The odd thing about the, Julia, it, it occurs in a context where the action will not be understood. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Charles proves he doesn't, he's, he says, oh, it's just complexes, it's just Freudianism. He misses the whole point of it. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. 
Very good. Other questions? Yes. I'm not sure if I can formulate this uh, correctly, but it, um, one of the things that's always sort of I don't know bothered me, I guess, about about the book is is the scene of Lord Lord Marchmain's death, where you know here's a man who has who has destroyed his family, run away with a mistress, abandoned his son Sebastian to drunkenness because he's so emotionally broken because his father was not yeah. there for him. Um, lived an absolute, you know, uh, bohemian sort of lifestyle all his life. And at the end, and even at the very end, when he knows he's going to die, he's still resisting any kind of confession, any kind of sacraments. The priest keeps coming to see him, sends him away. And then finally at the end, there's the dramatic scene where he makes the sign of the cross. And then the priest seems to insinuate... Uh, well, it is anyway. He says says it straight out that you know the the the, the devil was right there, and uh, but the, but you know grace basically snatched him away, and I've seen it happen so many times. And you know, as a Christian, it was you know I I always thought to myself, is is why really making the statement there that that, that this man was uh, in the end you know given salvation even after all of his appalling life just because he sort of made the sign of the cross at the end. Yeah, my. Um, uh, my my feeling there is uh, yes I do think that's what Wa is saying and I think it's uh, it all goes to we we never see the action of grace only the the uh, only something external and so for that reason there can always be an element of doubt in there in it we we don't really see Lord Marchmain being uh, uh, turning to God and being forgiven what we see is him making a gesture which people around him, uh, the heathen Charles, in fact, in, interpret as more significant than the veil of the temples being riven in two. And remember, Waugh is a creative writer, so he's not going to tell you that's what that scene means. Mm. He's going to leave it up to you. And so can we, can we know with certitude that uh, uh, any of these people uh, have been saved in the way uh, Waugh seems to suggest they have? No, we really can't. And uh, that's part of the irony of the unseen hook and the twitch upon the thread. Uh, when it happens, we really don't see it. We only see what, what comes after, and at least in some cases, and Lord Marchmain would be one, um, the, uh, the afterward itself admits of uh, uh, a number of different interpretations. You know, it's that, it's that, you know, we'd all love to be able to, to directly inspect primary causality, but we can't. <laughs> we, we can only see uh, what the finite human agents do, and what that means is uh, the door stays open. That's why, that's why I say, I think it's a, it's a, that's why I think it's such a, 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 a rich novel. And what, what, um, why I think uh, what makes it a great novel is not whether Julia ends up becoming a good girl ever thereafter, or Lord Marchman when he was died, but that Jesus comes back to the tabernacle. Brideshead revisited, and I'm firmly convinced that Jesus is the, re is the primary revisitor, not, not Charles Ryder. But I think that's another little, uh, that's an another little joke Waugh may be having on us. I don't know. I certainly can't prove it. I kind of want to pick you up the question he just asked and go into the scenes where he's pushing away the priest. Right. Is, it, is that not us pushing away from God and then at the very end when Christ comes back where, he, where Christ gives us that subtle nudge through the Holy Spirit to come back to him and we see it in our everyday lives. Do you think that's an accurate well, we assessment? Don't see it in the, well, we don't see it in Lord Marchmain's life because he doesn't live long enough. Uh, we see the, uh, the, the sign of the cross being made. Uh, certainly that's a legitimate interpretation. The, he's pushed away and at last he no longer resists. And the letter to, of Waugh to Lady Mary Ligon would certainly support that. Um, but uh, what we do actually see, and this we really do actually see, is that the Blessed Sacrament comes back to that tabernacle. Yeah. That's something we do see. And it's unambiguous. It's uh, so, and, and again, that's part of my uh, the, the the way I've 
I, uh, um, I read Brideshead uh, as I do. Uh, it's, it's that whole, it's that quote from Chester, an unseen hook and a twitch upon the thread. Uh, so much of what's, uh, uh, so much of uh, the motive uh, of the plot seems to lie in things that are unseen. Even the return of the characters, it tends to be very understated. We don't see a big dramatic conversion experience. Uh, we just see uh, Julia dismissing Charles because to have, uh, uh, to have married him would, would have been to set up a rival good. We don't see Lord Marchmain's penitence if it was there. We do see the sign of the cross and are free to interpret it as we like. Uh, we, we really, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, th that's the invisible side of the book. And I, in a kind of very direct and forward way, want to say, well, what's visible that we can count on? And oddly enough, it's the return of a certain important personage to Brideshead. And I don't mean Captain Ryder. Mm -hmm. I mean Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I, again, this, uh, there's, I think it, there, there's a kind of, sim, uh, there's a simplicity about uh, the, uh, uh, the novel in the sense that if you want to look at, for what's important in the novel, look at what can actually be verified, what can actually be seen. And what can actually be seen is the return of the Blessed Sacrament to that tabernacle. Uh, you know, w w you know uh, the, the, the features of the inner lives of the characters, we know very little about. Matter of fact, if you take a, a, a look at the book, um, there's very little in the way of introspection. Even um, Charles's reportage is very much a kind of third person narrative. Mm -hmm. No, we don't, uh, uh, we don't see his, uh, he, he doesn't report his emotional states. He's a bit like Swan in the remembrance of things past. He's a meticulous observer of things. But in fact, Jeremy Irons, I understand, uh, when he was asked about it, said uh, he was constantly trying fo to find ways to make the character of Charles uh, an interesting one because he found that character so boring. Well, I think that's what, I think that's what he, uh, well, I don't know. I, know. I don't know Jeremy Irons, but uh, I think that may have been what he was getting at. That this is uh, this is a narrator who uh, is very accurate and uh, even talented in his descriptions, but oddly enough, tells you very little about himself. There, the the inner life of Charles Ryder doesn't seem to appear much of anywhere, even though the subtitle is the, mem the sacred and profane memory, memories of C Captain Charles Ryder. Again, there's another little bit of a, the, the, uh, the whole book is full of irony upon irony, things which are said to be one way, but if you, the more closely you look at them, the, less, the, the more they look to be some other way. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons, too, the book will live. Like all great works of art, there's a, a kind of glowingly unified ambiguity mm. at the heart of it. But now and again, now this is, I, I could be just wrong. I'm not a, a literary critic uh, or a professor of English, um, but that's why uh, I say I'm going to put my money on, the, on, on interpreting Brideshead Revisited as first and foremost, Jesus coming back to Eden. And uh, then everything else you can interpret in the light of that. Do you mind a few more questions? Not at all. Uh, Father, am I to understand this home had a tabernacle it within? It had a house chapel. Okay, and can you maybe give us a, a little information on that? Like, who can have such a thing in their home? Okay, in, the, in those days, uh, I imagine still, uh, too, any great noble family uh, could have a private chapel. In fact, uh, we're told in the, in the book that the chapel was built by Lord Marchmain for his wife as a wedding present. Uh, and then it got shut up after, uh, after he left. And eventually, there's even a scene where uh, Lord Brideshead, uh, Charles, and uh, Lady Cordelia discuss whether or not the Blessed Sacrament should be removed and the chapel closed down permanently. Uh, eventually, it does happen after Lady Marchmain's death. Uh, but, but no, um, many great houses had private chapels. And you would find that they would, uh, uh, the, me the, uh, the families and the members of the household would all attend mass there and receive the sacraments. Because in those days, 
um, for the most part, uh, 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 cuius regio, eus religio. If the if uh, the nobleman was a Catholic, the uh, uh, those on the estate were Catholic. And again, they make a point of that, where Bridie uh, says to uh, Charles uh, about the chapel, uh, it's not as though we were old Catholics with everyone on the estate coming to mass. Uh, but no, that that's not unusual. It goes way back to. Uh, the early feudal period, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, the Duke of Norfolk has a chapel at, uh, um, uh, you know, at the uh, at, at uh, um, uh, Castle Howard, which was used for Brideshead. It wouldn't surprise me at all if there was a house chapel there, and a, and a and a private chaplain. I think there are even a few rich Americans that I know of, one down in Virginia, family down in Virginia, who have their own private chapel. And who pay a, 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 a juicy fat stipend to a priest who will come out and say mass for them <laughs> on Sunday mornings? Yeah. As so, so there's no like, church guidelines to say. Oh, there are, but a bishop is likely. But uh, a, a bishop isn't likely to complain too much, particularly when the family is a noble and powerful one. If they want a chapel in their house, sure, it's you know, it, that's a win-win situation. They get something, we get something. <laughs> Yeah. I would no, no things that that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, uh, permission for a private chapel is obtainable and is usually rather easily obtainable from a, from a local bishop, a local ordinary. Yeah. Um, you talked about Anthony Blanche. Oh yes, um, the 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 uh, the aesthete. Yeah. 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 My favorite characters because he's just so well, odd. He was he was given a bravura performance <laughs> by Nicholas Grace in the uh, in the television series, uh, and uh, you know it would be hard to improve on it because it was so over the top right, already. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, do you, how, what is his his role in the book? Um, you know, he mostly talks about charm and respectability. I think like, I th I think is that sort of the, like he's 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 the renegade, the bad Catholic. Uh huh. Uh, who, oddly enough, sees more of the truth right. than a lot of the very respectable, pious Catholics. Right. So but is he? So his is role is similar to Kara's. Okay. Uh, they they provide insight. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do you think his insight, like his insight about well, his mostly his insight is about charm and respectability. Yeah. Is you think Wa is saying that even those small things can kind of hinder grace? Is that what he's kind of no, pointing I, out? Oh no, I think what he's doing is, is saying that he's that's I think an indictment of the English upper class system and the people who become its tools and its property. See, Charles uh, um, is, uh, is trying, as Waugh himself mm -hmm. tried, uh, to become a kind of counterfeit aristocrat. Uh, he goes to the best tailors in London. He, he dresses the role. He hobnobs with the high nobility. Well, that's what Waugh did, too. So, uh, and, and I think uh, one of the things Waugh is saying is that there's something phony about that. And Antony, whatever other functions he fulfills, certainly, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, does that. In other words, uh, uh, Charles has destroyed his true self mm -hmm. in, uh, the, uh, clever, in the, in the uh, clever confabulation of this um, English upper class identity that he wears in public, and that it, it infects even his, even his art. It's gentlemanly, creamy English charm, playing tigers. You know. What would that be opposed, what would that, what is he contrasting that to? Like, what would be this antidote to that charm? He would say, he, uh, he, pretty early on, he seems to suggest that Charles could have been a very significant uh, painter, but that he's allowed uh, uh, himself simply to become a kind of uh, court monkey. You know. um, following up on the, uh, the first gentleman's question about uh, the sort of disappointment, one thing that uh, stood out to me was that when you mentioned the sort of uh, the noise and uh, commotion that is, that sort of permeates all these characters' lives yeah. in the in a, a very secular society. So, like when when we look at uh, you know life today, being a Catholic in society for Wa, like even what we were just talking about with uh, with Anthony, 
being uh, very upper class sort of can some, or I guess your, your position in society can sometimes make it difficult to carry out or, or to sort of live, you know, like, like live charitably or, or, mm -hmm. or live a life of virtue. So like, w would it be possible, would it be fair to say that Wa is sort of seeing, uh, seeing how secular society makes it difficult, like it, like it, re it requires twitches on the thread okay. for people to come it, back? It, that's, certainly, that, that's certainly true, but I think uh, Wall would say everybody uh, needs a twitch uh, regardless. So uh, there we're, we're dealing with a condition that follows um, uh, first from original sin, whatever gets added to it by uh, uh, false societal values. And I don't think he, he condemns the class system entirely because he does seem to suggest that a certain kind of holiness is possible. Cordelia is typically represented as being very much a member of uh, this class, but uh, as I say, she's the most sympathetic character in the book, and in spite of her, uh, her bad theology and her putty piety, uh, she comes across as holy in a way. That is, she, un she, she understands something important about Sebastian, even though she, her explanation of it is completely unsound. It's, it's curious because, like, obviously, you know, I, I, it's obviously logical that anyone can sort of achieve a level of, of spiritual success from any walk of life, but I wonder if he sort of became, uh, maybe he, he sort of just viewed society as a overwhelming hindrance uh, to, uh, to sort of people broadly being living good lives yeah. in terms of... I think uh, Waugh became faith. increasingly uh, alarmed with English society after the war and on all classes of society. Uh, I, I think his pessimism at the end extended to uh, the welfare society of Britain as a whole, not merely the upper classes. And in that respect, uh, his vision of, of English society in general was a dark one. And I suppose uh, it would have to follow from that that anyone in any society is always going to face enormous obstacles to holiness. But that's why, uh, that's why uh, uh, grace is, uh, you know, you know uh, overcomes all things. Uh, Father Charles. Thank you, Father. Um, You're so, uh, first, um, regarding uh, Charles's uh, lack of introspection or or manifesting introspection, uh, I think it's significant in that seen by the fountain, um, uh, Julia, of course, is very upset with him, and she says, why, why do you see everything secondhand? It, he says, oh, it's a way I have. Yes, and she says, I hate it. Yeah. I hate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. She basically <laughs> accuses him of never being somebody, but always playing. Right. Being somebody. Right. And even the, mo the, the monologue, Charles's narrative monologue, is a kind of uh, it's a kind of play acting. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. And at the, uh, I've always thought at the end of the novel, maybe this is, I'm conflating the novel with the TV series here, but um, uh, Charles smiles for the first time, basically. Like in well, you're, well, you're told that uh, that's the only reference in the book to his smiling. Uh, yes. I, I don't remember whether he smiles in, in the uh, teleplay or not. Yes, well, it's it's sort of uh, it's the first time that he comes across as cheerful, you might say. Oh yes, you're in a the, the uh, uh, yeah the lieutenant the captain says you're in a uh, you're, you say yes. you're in a, a good mood today or something like that. Yeah. Right, right, and it seems to me that he's finally achieved some kind of self forgetfulness, you know, uh, that he was always like cripplingly self aware. But uh, but but is that real self awareness? I don't think so. I, I think I, I think self forgetfulness. The introspection yeah. is a false awareness. Oh, I see. Right. It, because notice, he never identifies himself as anything. What he identifies are the things around him. Right. Right. So it's a deceptive kind of self awareness, but. Yeah. Uh, but it's not. I wouldn't even call it self awareness. I would call it a heightened state of consciousness. Sure. And but if if you're going to push that uh, that far, I would say if there's any moment of real self-awareness, it comes at the end. And of course, we can't see it. 
Right. It's right. one of those things we can't see. Right. Which brings me to the uh, right. other comment, <laughs> um, which, you know, I love how you started with the supposedly good Catholics, you know, and how Wall is really critiquing them uh, throughout the novel. And, uh, you know, um, that's something that I, uh, well, you know, sometimes we talk today about forming intentional disciples. Uh, certain people talk that way. And uh, that's fine, you know, to be intentional about your faith, but uh, I love how Wall illuminates and illustrates that the real growth that happens in our life happens sort of behind our back, you know, in ways that we're not aware of. Yeah. And, and that's been my point about the the twitch, the hooks, and the twitches all seem to be invisible. We only we only we only see things after the fact. In fact, I would maintain further with that when we, when anyone has a re what he or she later perceives to be a religious conversion, it can only be identified after the fact. You can't, you can't see it. And uh, I'm one of the least autobiographical people I know. In fact, I'm, I'm very concerned to conceal myself, but I'm going to tell you a story uh, <laughs> that illustrates this about me. I remember one morning, it was uh, a holy, holy Thursday morning during Lent, and I woke up, and the, um, and uh, I woke up saying, "Oh God, make me grateful for everything." And I suddenly realized my life had changed, and I didn't see it until I, I said, "Oh God, make me grateful for everything." And suddenly I realized I've been, I, I've been changed. It, it, it didn't happen then, it happened, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this after the fact. And I'm not it would not surprise me if that's the way it is uh, with most people. We don't really see what, what's called, uh, see, when people talk about a conversion experience, I'm immediately suspicious. <laughs> because a conversion can't be experienced, only its after effects. You see what I mean? Anytime anybody says to me, I directly witnessed my conversion experience, I'm inclined to say, then you had a direct introspective knowledge of primary causality. And that's impossible. <laughs> Only God can do that. You, you can't directly introspect your conversion. You can only know something about it after the fact. So, yeah. Very good. I think that's a good place to end. Okay. And one of the many things we're grateful for today is this excellent talk. Thank you very much for, for this.